Hi, my name is Bianca Pashola. I'm the COO of SIX, and welcome to Conversations with Minera Alamos, part one. I'd like to start today by introducing our presenters, Minera Alamos president, Doug Ramshaw, and Michael Saperka from Velocity Trade Capital. We'd like to start with a short presentation from Michael, and then we'll have a fireside chat. We'll end with a Q&A, and you can submit your questions in the Q&A column on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, without further ado, take it away, Michael. Thanks very much, uh, Bianca, and thanks, uh, Doug, for, for inviting me on to, to talk. Um, like uh, Bianca said, uh, we'll start with a, a bit of a, a gold macro presentation, giving our thoughts on, on where we see gold going, uh, hopefully putting some gold posts around it, uh, and then talking about the sector and, and then uh, dovetailing into a, a bit more of a conversation about where Monera fits in, in the broader universe. Um, Briefly on Velocity, for those that don't know, we are a global business with uh, offices around the world, including in major gold markets, uh, specializing in foreign exchange, futures, physical gold trading, and, and a growing resource-focused capital markets uh, business, uh, which I am a part of. So let's skip to the end and start with our conclusions. Um, in the near term, uh, we think that the 15% or so pullback that we've had from all-time highs here represents something close to uh, a floor. And, and effectively, we're consolidating at all-time realized highs here for producers, which is a lot more important than a couple of ticks in, in 2011. Um, second, the, the easy money, so to speak, in, in gold, but again, not gold producers, has probably been made with gold up about 50% 50, uh, 50 in the last uh, 18 months going back to May of 2019, which is when this cycle really kicked off uh, in our view, uh, long before the pandemic started. Uh, and finally, uh, we expect more volatility around vaccine news. We're getting some of that today, uh, more potential macro shocks. Uh, I think the result of the Georgia Senate elections in the US could be significant when, when it comes to fiscal stimulus. Um, every bull market has had multiple 10 to 15% uh, corrections. We don't think this one will be an exception, especially as gold perhaps struggles uh, a, a little bit more to really capture uh, investor attention in what looks like increasingly a bull market for, for everything right now. But in the longer term, we do see the, the bed is effectively made for a structural re-rate in gold. It's impossible to go back to normal, uh, whatever that means, whether that means 2019, or 2008 before the financial crisis. Uh, second, monetary inflation is already here with the 30% uh, increase in M2 driving our forecast, which historically in our view has been the best uh, goalpost for, for gold prices. And finally, material downside from here really implies a breakdown of fundamental relationships uh, between gold and the broader economy or financial system. Is it possible? Yes, not particularly likely in our view. So while we may not get as much euphoria or, or panic buying, depending on your perspective, as we've had in previous cycles, uh, we also shouldn't get the same hangover uh, and, and see a much more smooth climb uh, this time around. So maybe not as smooth as the line on the chart, but fundamentally, this is how we see the gold trade since 2011. Up and to the right, uh, and our forecast to 2,500 by 2025 basically follows that line higher, more analogous to the pre-GFC period uh, to, to the, the heights post-GFC. Essentially, we, we think about this cycle as a third reset of the gold price since 1975, following uh, the inflation explosion of the 1970s, QE and the financial crisis, and now the latest pandemic-driven crisis. That said, uh, the macro and the investment context for gold is, is very different than it was in pr prior cycles, even if some of the same dynamics play out. I guess that, that's the context for why, at least in, in my eyes, a, a longer term $2,500 gold call doesn't, doesn't maybe feel as bullish as it should, uh, but we're really more focused on, on scenarios and trying to put some thought into the numbers rather than just charting or hand waving. So is the gold trade over already? Uh, that certainly seems to be the narrative in, in some quarters. Uh, I don't think so. And, and like I said, we, we've certainly seen multiple pullbacks uh, during previous cycles. Uh, the move was very fast, over 1850 on the upside, breaking through the prior high of 1920, then 2000, a total of 10 trading days. And one of the spikes that, that you'd expect to see in, in both directions. You can see from the chart, however, uh, how immaterial looking the prior cycle high is. Um, 
in terms of a trading level. Uh, we've already traded almost as long over 1700, much longer over 1800 and 1900. Uh, in 2011, gold only really spent four or five days at levels that we've been trading at more or less since July. We see this pullback and the consolidation as constructive given, given the macro outlook that we see gold trading in over the next couple of years. So a soft point maybe, but, but I think the headlines about all time highs that were brief, basically brief ticks over 1800 and 1900 in 2011 aren't really analogous to where we are today, especially looking again at the impact on gold producers. So again, what we're most focused on for our longer term outlook is the broad money supply and looking at how gold has traded versus US M2 specifically. It's been a valuable guide in, in the past. It's the most direct and obvious um, pseudo exchange pair, so to speak. And as you can see on, on the right hand side, uh, gold has tracked fairly well uh, to what we consider to be true inflation, which is inflation of the money supply. Uh, and, and to further illustrate the point on the left-hand side, um, in the last 12 months, M2 has increased more than 20%. It's the biggest move ever by far as a response to the pandemic. And gold to date has really only kept pace with that uh, inflation. So money supply is what we base our forecast the ratio between the spot gold price and the implied price, which is the, the chart on the prior slide. So why do we say that gold is still cheap? Uh, because in our view, and according to our model, gold hasn't actually moved substantially in terms of this key ratio. And even with the 50% move since last year, and even at all time highs, we're nowhere near the relative valuation of gold versus fiat that we've seen during past uh, cycles, let alone the absolute peaks here in 2011, 1980 we're still more or less trading in line with the long-term average relationship of gold to money. So what I think is even more interesting is, is the lines across the chart, trying to delineate different periods of gold's relationship to money and the broader economy, whether that's rising, falling rates, QE, political tensions, so on. And I think that's, that's the best way to map out the paths that gold can potentially take here in the longer run. And, Flipping to the next slide, this is this is my uh, my favorite chart to, to put together. It's basically exactly what the title says. I, I think this is most useful in terms of highlighting the risk reward proposition for gold and, and putting some goalposts again around what the various price levels mean in the context of those historical ratios. In other words, plug in your macro assumptions, the model will spit out where gold should trade. Uh, and maybe the key point here is, is looking at the potential downside. And, and I'd, I'd highlight that a longer term breakdown uh, below current levels implies a, a return to gold's trading ratios from the early 90s. So practically a, a different universe uh, at, at this point. And, and to retest levels even close to $1,000 an ounce, which we last saw in 2015, would imply effectively all time lows for gold versus the dollars that have been printed since, which seems highly unlikely in, in our view, even in a longer term uh, scenario of a full global economic recovery, and then some on top of that. So our forecast, which is the, the dotted line here, uh, isn't heroic. It isn't implying that anything is different this time around or that will hit relative uh, highs uh, in terms of those ratios. It's simply suggesting that the long-term relationship between gold and fiat will at least hold as it's held even during the 2013 bear market. It's almost a hybrid of the top and the bottom of the chart. Um, and to paraphrase, paraphrase uh, Alan Greenspan, it, it's irrational financial exuberance, but driven by central bankers and cheap money in the quest for the 70s style inflation uh, that drove prior highs. Um, and then you average out somewhere in, in the middle. Uh, in our view, the realistic risk reward proposition over the next several years looks something like 15% downside or so to the pre-pandemic highs around 1600 an ounce and up to about 100% uh, upside should QE and elevated deficits continue into 2021 2022 and start to mirror more closely the, the post-financial crisis uh, era. So uh, about that macro outlook, um, given how catastrophic the pandemic has been, the damage done to global economies, why aren't we even more bullish? Well, I, I guess we'd argue that gold probably should have moved higher and, and, and should be consolidating at higher levels. Uh, but sentiment has changed pretty quickly and, and the macro setup for gold, especially in the in the short term, is fairly different than it was coming out of the crisis in 2008. 
Uh, three quick points on that. First, uh, while the progression of the pandemic and, and lockdowns is still a, a bit of an open question, it feels fair to say, thankfully, that we're probably closer to the end of the shock of COVID-19 than we are to the beginning. Uh, second uh, is our view that I've alluded to a little bit, that the macro cycle has been accelerated, uh, in part going back to the thesis that, that we're still in the continuation of the financial crisis rather than in a, in a new discrete crisis uh, in and of itself. Information is being processed faster, money moves faster, and sentiment seems to be shifting on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we thought the crisis 10 years ago moved fast, but, but 2020 has really been uh, on a different level. And, and the third, third reason why we don't see the, the same kind of peaks and troughs coming uh, that we've seen in prior cycles is, is that this is an increasingly complex financial universe. Gold simply doesn't occupy the same, uh, maybe unique place in the investment matrix uh, that it once did. Uh, even since the last cycles, uh, uh, last cycle, incentives for money manager and even retail investors have, have changed fairly dramatically. Types of instruments that are available, uh, obviously crypto, and we'll have a, a slide about uh, Bitcoin later in the presentation. Uh, one of the most shocking charts I've seen, actually, to digress a little bit, is, is the volume of open call contracts miles beyond, miles beyond previous highs. Uh, not sure what that means long term, uh, but certainly Robinhood and, and options uh, day traders weren't dominating the, the uh, investment narrative in the landscape uh, in, in 2009. So that's not to say that we're bearish on prices from here. We're clearly not. Only that for now, absent another structural market shift, we don't think that the same kind of parabolic runs that gold saw in, two, in 1980 or, or 2011 are as likely. And again, we're talking about gold here and, and not producers, uh, which we'll get to in just a minute. Um, I, I won't spend too much time on the next few charts, basically highlighting uh, the constructive macro backdrop for, for gold. We've talked about the money supply. This chart, oh, I'm sorry, I've got to flip the slide. Um, so th this chart highlights uh, the, the US Fed balance sheet expansion in, in 2020. Uh, relative to 20, uh, 2008 and the financial crisis. Uh, obviously an upside risk for, for gold uh, should further expansion come in, in 2021. Uh, we're biased to believe that uh, central bankers are shifting the focus from monetary, uh, monetary um, stimulus to, to fiscal stimulus. Uh, obviously we'll see what transpires over the rest of the year, uh, but if we don't see the same wave uh, of, of continuing QE, uh, again, we might see gold prices capped relative to, to the prior parabolic types of runs that, that we've seen uh, in the past. I'll, I'll highlight one more thing on this slide though. This time around, we all know the playbook. And again, this is about macro cycles compressing. Uh, QE, central bank support of global economies are, are really now a matter of degree rather than necessity. And remember again, that the gold really started to climb well before COVID in mid 2019. Uh, with the first rate cut uh, in the cycle back in July, driven by, by a resumption of that rate cut cycle and, and the start of mini QE and the growth of, of the Fed balance sheet. Again, back, back over here. Next up, um, quickly, th these charts shouldn't be unfamiliar to gold investors. Real rates are coming off of mid-pandemic lows but they never recovered to pre-GFC highs in the last cycle. We think a similar scenario plays out post-COVID. Again, the short-term risk is that a 2021 macro rebound caps gold's gains, but in the longer run, the trend continues to move in, in only one direction. And similarly with, with CPI on, on the right-hand side of the page, uh, it, it barely budged uh, with years of QE after the financial crisis and low inflation, uh, low, low consumer inflation hasn't stopped gold from massive gains over the last 20 years. Again, back to our point about monetary inflation. So with central banks upping the urgency of, of driving inflation higher, uh, talking about overshooting on the upside, whether or not that's even possible, uh, the risk again only appears to be the up, uh, to the upside in, in the longer term. On debt, uh, I don't think I'm breaking any news to this audience by, by telling anyone that uh, government debt is, is effectively out of control, uh, even more so than it was uh, before the crisis. Uh, obviously, we'll see how 2021 plays out, but deficits, even excluding specific stimulus, still expected to be much higher than pre-pandemic levels. Current forecasts for debt to GDP don't get any better the further out you go 
And these numbers, these projections are from the US uh, Government Accountability Office. So I'll, I'll go back again to my point about fundamental economic relationships. Absent a, a miracle of economic growth, far exceeding levels that we were at prior to the pandemic, and, and I'm not sure why one would expect that, any potential cure for debt, uh, sovereign debt, uh, should be go bullish gold in the long run. And finally, on the US dollar, we don't think the relationship is really as straightforward as, as many discuss. Clearly, gold has benefited over the last few weeks from dollar weakness in a risk on environment. Uh, in theory, though, that should also drive a, a gold sell off. And so we look at uh, relative movements in the US dollar outside of the total supply of dollars as more of a near term trade barometer. Uh, in the long run, the, the context for dollar weakness or strength matters more than the direction. And as we've seen in the past, gold and the dollar can certainly move together up or down, and especially for, for producers. If we do end up in a currency race to the bottom, so to speak, uh, with the dollar maintaining relative strength, margin for production outside the U.S. has the potential to grow further, even on a flat gold tape, as we've seen with Canadian, Australian, and, and maybe more relevant for this uh, discussion, uh, Mexican production. So where could we be wrong? And obviously I'm, I'm glossing over a lot of very big macro context, uh, concepts in, in the interest of time. Uh, happy to chat further with anyone on the call uh, at a later date on, on any of these points and more. Um, but to the downside specifically, given I think the, the upside uh, case for gold is pretty clear, uh, I think I've addressed most of, of these issues. It really boils down to, to what I've been talking about in terms of an accelerated cycle versus the financial crisis, maybe less near-term monetary fiscal goosing of, of the global economy than, than was expected in, in the summer. Uh, specifically in terms of austerity or, or deflation, I, I think it's pretty clear at this point from, from voters and from central bankers, um, given especially what, what happened uh, in, in, in Europe uh, after the financial crisis, that, that it's not really an option anymore if, if they have any say on the matter. Uh, more money will be printed, more economies will be supported to drive inflation almost no matter the cost. And, and that's been fairly explicitly stated at this point. So finally, on, on Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies, just one chart here highlighting what, what I think is more important for, for gold watchers than, than the Bitcoin price or, or market cap. And obviously there's another conversation to be had about the other cryptocurrencies. Uh, it's really volume and adoption. And, and Bitcoin has been approaching all time highs recently. The narrative that, that it's replacing gold is starting to gain some traction in, in some quarters uh, with a wave of institutional or, or serious investors uh, talking it up as opposed to, you know, not, not to, to create stereotypes, but the kids in hoodies that were really the, the public face of, of Bitcoin in, in 2017. So again, without spending too much time on the subject, we do think it's different this time than it was in, in a couple of years ago. The fact that BTC volumes are approaching a third of gold's average traded uh, daily volume is, is in itself reason to pay attention. If you layer on all the other cryptos, you're, you're, you're approaching 50% or more of, of gold's volume. Is Bitcoin replacing gold? No, nope, I don't think so, at least not anytime soon. Uh, but I definitely think that there's an argument to be made that marginal investors that, that would have been gold buyers are instead investing in crypto as a macro hedge. The number definitely isn't 100%, definitely isn't zero, but I think it's almost certain to rise over time. It has the potential, if it hasn't already, to, to start to put a cap on gold's upside. Uh, and again, those ratios that we talked about uh, versus fiat currency. Um, before I flip into the producers, uh, Doug, I, I know we've been talking about uh, Bitcoin uh, a little bit. Uh, and, and before I ask you for your thoughts on gold, did you want to uh, chip in and, and give your thoughts uh, on, on what you're seeing uh, relative to, to these alternatives? Uh, yeah, Michael. Um, first off, thanks for, for coming on. Um, I think one thing I've observed with Bitcoin, um, I mean, gold is and the Bitcoin proponents will talk about gold being archaic. And when you look at conferences uh, attended by mining investors, um, maybe we, we look a little archaic, uh, a lot of bald heads, gray hair, and, and everything else. I, I think of something on Twitter that I've noticed is some of the biggest um, mining Twitter uh, names out there. Um, 
probably cap out at around 20,000 users, uh, or followers, I should say. And it's interesting when you see these, these uh, crypto gurus, you go and click on their profile and they're 100,000, 150,000 uh, uh, you know, followers. And, and I think we talk in the mining industry about there's a generation gap in, a, you know, in, the, in the operators and, and investors and all aspects of the business. Um, I think our team is one of the younger uh, groups out there, but uh, there are generation gaps. I think we see it in the investors. I think you're right that we need to pay attention um, to to uh, to Bitcoin purely because the demographics uh, are changing a lot, and it's um, so. But yeah, you know, there's something to be said about uh, backing something which has a, such a storied, archaic history like gold. So, um, will it be replaced? I, I doubt you. You can erase the history that that gold has has presented over thousands of years. Yeah, I, I I broadly agree, and um, it, it's hard it's hard to talk about Bitcoin in, in isolation. But certainly, I, I remember uh, the first uh, the first time I talked to an, a gold investor about Bitcoin was probably 2016, and I spent uh, every the, the first 10 minutes of every conversation on a marketing trip uh, to to New York, uh, explaining what a Bitcoin was, what a cryptocurrency was, and why anyone should care. Um, and and uh, the, the level of knowledge was zero. And to see today, uh, you know, real investment funds, uh, real investors uh, talking about Bitcoin and, and driving the narrative in that direction is certainly certainly a huge change. And and in the last couple of years, and and will have impacts on macro investing one way or the other, not just for gold. Okay, gold equities. Um, so I'll, I'll give a little bit of an overview of how we think about the sector in context, um, and then and then get into a, a more specific conversation about where uh, Monero fits uh, with Doug. Um, again, starting with the punchline, um, which uh, is basically that even on a gold a stable gold price. Producers are, are very well positioned to rally into 2021, assuming the status quo. But if we see a little more consolidation, especially larger producers start to deliver on scale, liquidity and yield, multiples that are still well below prior cycle highs could really start to expand. And that has significant implications up and down the sector. Um, so first point, having covered gold stocks for almost 15 years now, it's almost shocking to see how healthy balance sheet margins and, and cash flow uh, is relative to, to where we've been. The, the post 2013 pain of cost cutting and, and divestment has on average paid off and the timing really couldn't be better for a sharp move higher in gold. Uh, that said, we still think there are just too many producers, especially seniors and intermediates. Uh, the sector needs a lot more con uh, consolidation, but, but paradoxically, I think the higher gold price may get in the way and keep business models going that otherwise would have would have merged. And that probably contributes to stocks on average being being cheap, or at least a big separation between the, the rich and the poor, so to speak, when it comes to investor interest. Longer term, though, we, we think we're, we're a long way from the potential for the kind of value destructive decisions that had to be unwound after 2013. Back to our gold thesis, we think this period maps a lot closer to 2004, 2005, uh, rather than 2010, 2011. It doesn't mean there won't be deals, though. Um, we've seen a lot of them. Uh, and, and, and while the higher gold price should uh, eventually start to squeeze more organic production out of existing assets, portfolios, most producers still need growth. Competition for high quality development assets should, should be fierce. And finally, the, the entire planet is seeking yield. And, and even if gold itself doesn't capture the investment, uh, the investing public's attention, uh, in the same way it is, as it did before, the status quo dividend growth we expect from, produ uh, from producers should. So a couple of slides here, uh, I'll flip through them a little faster, but these two charts illustrate, uh, again, what a difference, oh, sorry, I gotta flip those slides. Um, these, these two charts illustrate what a difference a few years makes. Uh, to sector total margins much higher than ever before after years of cost cutting and deferred capital on the left-hand side here. 
uh, and balance sheets look much better than they have in at least a decade. In fact, the, the sector as a whole at spot prices could be net cash positive by the end of 2021, which is again, just shocking from my perspective anyways, considering where we were just five years ago. And it's not just the gold price, but it's the combination of the gold price rising just as all of the, the hard work and the pain in right-sizing the sector was starting to finish up. On consolidation, we could talk about this quite a bit, but one of the big problems in our view over the last several, several years for the sector, it's been too little capital, too many options due to a combination of the bear market, divestment, deferred M&A, as well as the rise of passive money in the sector. But over the last 18 months, the situation has started to change. Again, more separation at the top, between the larger, more liquid names and everyone else. And you can see that Barrick uh, and Newmont have been expanding as, as share of total capital investment uh, in, in the sector through their transactions. And the, the, the long tail is getting to be a smaller and smaller portion of the overall capital in the sector. Another slide on consolidation. We think it's coming. Definitely keep an eye on, on Barrick and Newmont, uh, by the way, when their standstill expires in July. I think the next six months could be very interesting uh, at the top end of the space. And again, uh, that could trigger further rational, rationalization in the sector. Started already five larger deals globally this year, plenty of smaller mergers and, and a high likelihood of year, uh, a high likelihood of more to come rather. And this, this chart, uh, I think illustrates why it matters. Uh, and, and again, similarly to gold in a way, this is a far more complex universe than it was 10 or 15 years ago during the last cycle. Um, the landscape, uh, capital is increasingly flowing into uh, physical and equity ETFs that basically didn't uh, exist last time around, as well as the royalty companies, which have exploded and satisfy a lot of the criteria of especially generalists, low risk yield and at least some leverage to metal prices, and that's that section here that that basically didn't 200 billion in capital, 3 billion in daily traded value in, in market segments that, that weren't around during the last cycle. So by the time you get to the senior producers, the intermediate producers and the juniors, um, there's less and less flow. Uh, between the 80 plus names in the GDX and GDXJ, it's harder and harder to stand out versus the pack and attract the capital needed to grow. And, and for sure, that's that's something that I'd, I'd love to hear Doug to talk uh, talk about in, in just a minute. Um, why else does it matter? Valuations. Uh, despite the lift that we've seen off the lows in 2015, multiples haven't come close to the levels even early in the last cycle. Uh, and as estimates uh, continue to grow, we don't think that absent a new wave of investors, you're gonna see gold stocks get more expensive until later in the cycle. In our view, at a 10% free cash flow yield or higher, uh, the sector remains very cheap, uh, much cheaper than, than equities, uh, especially on the dividend yield side, of the broader market, um, and especially after the equity underperformance uh, since gold peaked over 2000 an ounce. Just a couple more slides here. Maybe this is the most important one. This is really the opportunity, I think, uh, that hasn't really been fully understood by the market. Um, as, as maybe negative I've been, as, as some of my comments have been on the sector, this is an underweight market with little generalist interest, underpinned by high margins, free cash flow, growing M&A activity, new investment in organic growth, and, and most importantly, uh, in, in the new era of, of cash return and yield, delivering on the very thing that everyone on the planet is chasing in a negative rate macro universe. So dividends could reach 3 billion or higher next year. More and more producers are instituting or reinstituting dividends. And we expect more growth, higher payout ratios, more buybacks, and in general, during this phase of the cycle, more yield. And, and one way or another, we see that as really capturing the intention of marginal investors in the sector over the midterm, especially if our gold forecasts are realized. Uh, cash return, I'll also note, serves as a very good break on CapEx uh, acquisitions and the kind of uh, decisions that led to the write downs of the last five years. Very effective way to communicate to the market that past mistakes uh, won't be repeated, for, for now at least. Um, I'll, I'll skip through that. Uh, that. That one basically just shows uh, how gold equities outperformed uh, post uh, GFC. Certainly, potential for gold, gold to perform uh, along with the broader uh, gold equities, rather, to perform along with the broader market. Um, and, and again, showing that despite the outperformance versus gold uh, so far in 2019, 2020, 
there's a long way to go uh, before um, the, the prior peaks in 2011 uh, might be reached. So recognizing I've, I've probably gone a bit over time and, and talked for, for too long, um, Doug, why don't uh, you jump in and uh, and and uh, maybe start uh, with your thoughts on on gold, broadly speaking, and and um, and how how you see the market going, uh, whether you agree or disagree with uh, anything that I might have uh, talked about, and and maybe most importantly, how how your decision making evolves for Monera in in however you see the cycle playing out. Yeah, well, thank you, Michael, and I, I think the audience retreated there to an excellent uh, presentation. Um, there's not much I, I, I would disagree on. I, you know, you and I have talked in it from the first time we spoke. We had very similar views on things. Um, you know, I, I do expect. I, it's kind of funny. I, I, I think about your consolidation argument, and and I think it all plays into. Right now, the majors are, and, and intermediates are doing what they needed to do and the gold prices help, which is clean up the sins of the past. Um, and with a rapid move in gold, it's, it's remarkable how quickly um, you can eradicate uh, some of those sins. Um, you know, I, I think as those balance sheets get cleaned up, we'll, we'll see that move to m a next year which is you know hopefully another signal to to investors that you know things are you know there's there's value in in mergers but i i think the m a will continue at least initially with a trend um of of mergers of equals um you know we've seen a lot of them this year uh alio argonaut uh taranga uh west um endeavor um even <laughs> Back in the day, uh, it seems a few years back now, and I don't want to think we were a train, trendsetter, but the merger that brought Corex and Monera together was an example of, of um, investors understanding that the you, you invested in something um, that, that might be a, an M&A candidate, not for the premium on, on announcement day, that all normally gets eaten up by the time a deal closes anyway, but more, you know, how can value be unlocked? Um, and, you know, the classic one plus one equals three. And I think, you know, we're seeing that. And, and I think that's actually, if we can continue with the merger of equal approach, that's going to be a more attractive proposition to, to the generalist investors who aren't seeing overpayment for assets, but seeing rationalization of two businesses, which makes sense, you know, against this backdrop of of um, of growth and and better stewardship of of finances. So um, I think what's what's interesting with, and I'm asked this question quite a lot. Um, you know, are we with our business model meeting more competition for assets or, or capital, or, but certainly on the asset front? Um, and what I haven't seen with, you know, these, these high, you know, record high gold prices is a whole bunch of operating teams suddenly come out of the woodwork saying, you know what we should be doing? Let's build gold mines. You know there is a real shortage of of operating talent and and companies that actually want to build these real businesses um and you know what's attractive for the the smaller producers coming through is they can offer um real growth where where the bigger boys are looking at ways to just maintain these record high production rates and the resource bases that are required to support them, um, you know, which will lead to some of the, that rationalization at the top end of the curve. But I think where there's excitement, and we're seeing it with the re-rates in, in uh, soon to be or new producers, you know, whether it be the pure golds that eclipsed uh, a, a billion dollar market cap the other, uh, I think on Monday, or it might have been Friday of last week, you know, or you know, even producers like Step Gold Fury and or Monero, as we we're on the cusp of entering that realm, that's a pretty small universe um, of companies that can do that. And I think it offers investors something where where the majors 
um, you know, can't offer that. So th that's what's driving our business model is, is um, you know, we, we have a smart business. We've been lucky with timing for sure. Um, we're going to come into uh, the world of gold producers with a bit of a rarity um, aspect to this company. We'll be debt free. Um, so hopefully, you know, in our case, we don't have sins of the past to unwind, um, and we and we can benefit very, very quickly um, from from this current gold market we're in. Uh, Doug, just before uh, we go on, uh, we can we can hear you. Uh, we can't see your video. Um, I don't know if you you might be able to turn it off and and back on, um, or if you're preserving bandwidth that way. Um, I will I will definitely try turning. Uh, I think people have seen enough of my face over the last year doing these anyway. So I'm uh, right. Strategic I'm uh, technical issues. I see. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, but no, more, more importantly, I think is that people can hear me. So I'm glad that's working. Okay, very good. Uh, so driving on. So what I'm really interested in, and, and we've had this conversation, is is that you, your strategy as a company uh, was very different and, and counter cyclical. Um, you were adding out, you created the company, you added assets, uh, you you conducted your feasibility studies. Uh, and your exploration in in a in a in a much worse gold price environment, much less investor interest. Um, you know, I, I think it's beneficial for for people to hear what your thinking was, why you you did things that way. Were you expecting a a gold rebound? Um, and and maybe more importantly, how has your thinking as a company changed over the last eighteen to twenty four months? Yeah, I, you know, Darren, our CEO, always says, uh, you know, the, the good thing about bootstrapping and just getting up to production, you're not then, you, you can very quickly, if you're right with the cycle, and this business model was built to survive poor gold market, gold prices as well. I think, you know, going back to some of the issues with the sector, which, which had been a detract, detractant for uh, generalist investors, um, were, were assets that were acquired and, and deals that were done um, uh, and debt loads that, that meant, you know, we, we started conditioning the, the, the mining investor to think that $1,300, $1,400 gold was not a good gold price. Well, that was the gold, gold price environment or even less than that when we were building out this business model. And that's important because we want to, I don't know where, um, I share your thoughts as to where gold's going, but I don't know when it's going to come off from those levels. Um, the importance for us is to make sure that when it does, that you know it's a sustainable business model in in tougher gold environments. Which um, uh, so uh, in terms of what drives um, us to do what we do. Well, I think it's important. We're in a jurisdiction which offers something that the sector at a large is probably battling more than any other issue facing mining, and that's permitting. And so, you know, when you can rapidly permit things and you, with heat bleach, can, can build things in a very capital, low capital intensity and, and, and quick manner, um, you can capture that cycle if you're right. But more importantly, we, we wanted to go after assets that would, if, if gold hadn't taken off, we would have been more than okay. So, I mean, Sarah Aurora, our, our recent acquisition is a great example of, I'm pretty sure two years from now, uh, I will have slides in my deck that won't just be a testament to our team and our business model, but also to the jurisdiction we're in that it's very rare in this business that you can grab an asset that has nothing more than a resource. And within two years, you've got slides in your deck talking about how that is in production. Um, that That's a rarity, but, um, uh, you know, so, so we're going to continue to look for assets which we think will work in, in much poorer gold environments as well but offer the full leverage to higher gold prices if, if we continue to, to maintain this good fortune of, of entering uh, the world of gold producers with a north of $1,800 gold price. 
And, and just to that point, there's a there's a question in the the chat uh, about my view of uh, Alamos and and the target, um, which is a very good point. Uh, I was going to get to it. I, I promise. Um, my target is is a dollar thirty Canadian, and that's that's based on our price stack. Um, and and I'd only point out that that is a highly discounted uh, valuation uh, because to your point, Doug, uh, when when you start to plug in these elevated gold prices on on a very low capital intense uh, business uh, with the kind of growth that that you could have once Santana is in production early next year and then the next. Sarah Doro, presumably, and the rest of the portfolio, the numbers get, as we've discussed, pretty silly uh, in a hurry. So I, I put I put relatively punitive discounts on on your projects at the asset level um, that come off as you hit milestones on execution. So Sarah Doro, you had the resource earlier this year. Uh, Santana production is a big de-risking event, and and from my conversations with investors, that's the way that they've been looking at the shares as well. As you hit these milestones, the 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 visibility that the market should get into the amount of cash flow that Monero should be generating, even at spot levels, even as you say, at much much lower levels, thirteen hundred, fourteen hundred, is fairly spectacular, and and I think stands out uh, versus. Uh, almost all of the the, the junior uh, developer peers that are close to production, and and again going back to scarcity and, and the sector, there just aren't very many producers that are are close to production uh, that have just entered into production uh, and and should see that kind of leverage, not just from the producer producer re rate, but from from the idea that you are all of a sudden generating huge amounts of cash flow for on projects that were designed in a much lower gold price environment. Um, so that that's kind of that's kind of my two cents on on my thesis for Alamos and how I see things playing out. Doug, can can you talk a little bit more about um, about what you think? Is that what you're hearing from investors as well? Uh, what are these sort of key milestones over the next six to twelve months? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the you know there's there's a a lot of perceived that you know uh, re rate that's already coming into the stock, but but I think that's partly because people aren't looking at the, they see a market cap and then they see our initial production rate and they think how can you ascribe that but as as we as we get into production the, the those cash flow numbers will will more than support it um and maybe it's to your point there's such a lack of of comparables out there and and the vast majority of companies in this space aren't really looking to build a business you know the, the, there's a group of developers that are and there's a group of developers that hope hope their assets are going to be sold um you know so it's it's hard for people to compute where values can be for a for the right junior producer in the right gold environment when they look at values of 97 percent of these expiration companies and and developers so um I, you know that will all be about execution on our side. We're, so far, um, the market has has rewarded us for execution on the on at permitting level, at, at smart business decisions with acquisitions um, and the like, um, and and the fact that you know we 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 elected to to take a little bit of project dilution in the form of royalty, remaining debt free. I think that there's real value in 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 presenting ourselves next year as a new gold producer, but you know that's that's not you know leverage with a whole bunch of debt as well. Um, uh, so no, I I I think that um, you know that's that's the benefit for this company, and it's hard for some investors to to look at it the way you are because they they're just not used to to thinking about companies spitting out a whole bunch of uh, about a bunch of cash in a sector that let's face it in Q1 of this year when gold was averaging $1500 an ounce there were a whole bunch of producers that were bleeding on the bottom line still um, you know and and again that's partly luck on our part partly you know, I, I think going after the assets which we do, which don't necessarily command huge market attention, where I think that we will really benefit is that move into production where 
the market has to pay attention to the, the, the kind of money that we can spit out. And that's where you and other analysts covering this stock have really honed your analysis is, is you just can't avoid looking at how much money these, these low capital projects uh, that we're developing can make. So we have to execute on that. Um, looking forward to, to uh, you know, getting rid of the developer tag and uh, and the production tag, and I think we will re-rate um, accordingly in twenty twenty one. So was that was that the focus? Just to to pick on that point, uh, and then and then maybe it's a good time to flip over to to questions. In terms of. Uh, um, first, Paul, well, mining is expected to commence in Q1 um, and, you know, first gold sometime in Q2. Uh, we expect by late Q3, early Q4, that Santana will be spinning off cash that will support the uh, construction of Cerro Dororo, which we hope with permits in hand, around Q4 of next year. The strategy with that project is to basically have our existing cash and and cash contributed from Santana to support the building of project number two. Um, thereafter, you know, a construction decision at Fortuna can be um, uh, supported either uh, through taking on a bit of debt if needed, uh, because we feel like Santana and Cerro Loro can can grow substantially in their own right. So that free cash is probably better deployed into growing those initial mines, but it's a lot easier taking debt on when you've got two mines up and running, or, you know, we can take a more sedate approach to growth. Um, uh, and I think building maybe three mines in four years isn't exactly sedate and, and, and see projects one and two support the development of project number three. Um, you know, the most important thing in the cash flow numbers Michael talks about is we shouldn't feel like we're in a hurry to, to I, I think that's when companies can make mistakes. We want to uh, have the same kind of financial discipline that the majors are showing right now in terms of cleaning up their, their balance sheets and preparing for a wave of M&A. But maybe in past cycles, they were, and, and perhaps covid COVID was responsible for delaying some M&A and maybe we're giving the majors too much credit that you know, perhaps their what pocketbooks would have been open sooner rather than later. Uh, COVID has allowed them the time to really clean up um, their book um, and the M&A will come, I think, appropriately in this cycle. So, um, uh, so yeah, that's to Martin who asked the question. That's, that's kind of where we're looking at Santan and we'll have an update probably early in the new year so that we can give a little firmer guidance on that end of construction. Um, it's a little, it's a few months behind where we were expecting pre COVID, but I think it's a testament to, to the team down there that even in, in a time of COVID we're, we're, we're going to be on the upper end of our pre COVID guidance for construction at Santana. Um, that in no small part is due to, the fact that our team is based in Mexico, um, you know, we're, we're not dealing with fly and fly out camps and the like. And I think credit to my uh, uh, my colleague and partner in this company, Darren Kernigan, who today flies back to Canada from Mexico. He has been down there for nine months straight, um, overseeing things. And uh, he always was going to be down there a lot this year. I didn't expect him to. I'm sure he didn't expect to be down there nine months straight. But uh, uh, that's exactly where, as shareholders, we would we would want the 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 real brains of the the company. So, uh, but I'm glad he's going to get a bit of a break over Christmas. We've got a big year ahead of us next year. Well, look, I, I mean, I'm I'm happy at, at this point. I think Doug, you've covered uh, most of the key milestones here. I mean, the the question that I was going to ask, and I think you've touched on it, but but again, it's it's about it's about standing out from from the crowd, uh, and and whether that's um, you know going back to the earlier conversation about getting attention in in a world that's clamoring more for for Bitcoin tweets uh, or or the latest uh, shiny tech story or or whatever it is. You know, I'm I'm curious. 
maybe more from a marketing perspective than than even from an execution perspective. Although obviously everything comes down to to execution. Like I, I suppose this presentation, these fireside chats are, are a way of doing it. But how are you thinking about really marketing the company and, and getting the message out there in in a different way? Yeah, like you know, I I I think. I've actually, we're very lucky. We have close to 18% of our shareholders are US generalists, and they've been in the company for several years now. Um, what they have allowed me to do is, and, and when I talk to them, they get me thinking much more like a generalist uh, and not like a mining guy. And I've honed our presentation, and I think our corporate strategy is honed to appeal to a generalist investor. Uh, I'm going to continue to hammer that home. Um, and, and there's nothing better than actually starting to have some financial metrics to support that. So whilst we might not be the gl most glamorous company in terms of headline resources, um, in terms of the widgets that we are selling and making money, on, you know, they happen to be, you know, made of gold. But, you know, we're in the business of selling widgets. Uh, I, I, and I want to appeal to generalist investors. Uh, so all our metrics are about, you know, a frame around the generalist investor. And I think you, you're seeing that with majors now, you know, looking at reinstituting dividend policies and everything else. That's been my, my kind of sense of how best to market this company for the last two years. Um, and, and I, you know, with, with some wind in my sails from actually having the first mine up and running, because there's nothing that's probably more boring to a generalist than talking permitting and talking construction. But when you actually start talking about the, you know, what's coming out of your, your, your widget factory, uh, you know, that, that gives them a whole range of metrics to judge you on. So, you know, I, I hope that, you know, we can stand out as, as as a very profitable company and real profit, not fudged profit, real, real, uh, you know, even, you know, on a per ounce produced basis. And, uh, you know, so I am looking forward to leaving the developer story uh, behind us. There's only so many times you can tell the same same story. And um, I was glad when we got the new acquisition uh, in place, it gave me something a little fresh for our audience and our shareholders. Uh, but I think it not only did it give something fresh, I think it sent the message that um, we are we want to be a growth story. We're not going to rest on our laurels. We're going to look for other assets that make sense for our, our shareholders um, that that can grow this company so that you know we will have an organic pro growth you know, production profile um, so that even in a flat or declining gold market, we can be a growth story. And what's really interesting is each of the assets in their own right can grow. So again, you know, that can compound the, the overall production profile of the company that we don't need higher gold prices. I will gladly take them, especially as you're starting up the company and capturing in 2021, a, a year of really good gold prices, I think sets an, a really, really valuable contribution to, to the, the balance sheet that will drive a lot of uh, growth opportunities thereafter. But um, uh, we, you know, so, so I think, so I am, I'm eager to talk about production and, and happy that our execution on permits has given people a lot of confidence to expect the same kind of execution moving forward as mine builders now. The team's done it multiple times before. You know, Santana will remind the market that the team's done it multiple times before. Um, and we look forward to doing it multiple times within this company. I'll just, I'll just point out quickly back to my valuation. Uh, at spot prices, my my nav, not my target at at a dollar thirty, but my nav uh, is about two dollars Canadian, and that's 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 a pretty base case valuation. I'm not baking in a, a lot of uh, a lot of production growth or uh, or exploration driven growth uh, at at any of the assets. Um, so yeah, I, I'd echo that in terms of uh, the the first stage of of, of production. Uh, as Mark mentions on the chat, adding cash to the balance sheet and starting to demonstrate quarter by quarter 
uh, what's happening on, uh, on, uh, on, on the asset versus liability side, it's going to be hard to ignore. Even if you don't care about gold, if the sector is yielding 5% and the S&P 500 is yielding 2%, uh, investors will come to where that margin is, and and uh, Minera looks lined up to be one one of the best stories heading into 2021 on on that front. Um, Doug, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see. John has a question on the chat uh, about uh, uh, activism uh, and and potential uh, interruptions uh, relative to Equinox. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's uh, with Equinox. Uh, Mexico uh, social license is, is important in any country. Uh, uh, tier one jurisdictions, or you know, or, or anywhere, whether it be Africa, Latin, Latin America, uh, Mexico is no different. What I like about Mexico is there is immediate respect of the communities provided by the permitting framework in Mexico. You can't start federal permitting without community agreements. Now, getting a community agreement and maintaining that social license is where a lot of companies slip. I don't know all the background behind uh, the issues Equinox are facing. I know that our, you know, I think we are greatly benefited by the fact that our team is largely a group of Mexican nationals that have worked with Darren down there for 12 years. Federico Alvarez, our COO, uh, handles all the community relations they're looking at someone that is one of their own. Um, when COVID hit, the first thing we did was make sure that we had a huge amount of medical supplies, oxygen tanks, and everything available to support the local community should any issues arise. There weren't issues, but, but it was an important thing because when we come into their area and, and are looking to develop something which can benefit them greatly, we become part of that community. Um, I'm, in, I'm very, very comfortable that our approach, um, uh, you know, is, is the right approach of, of operating within uh, a community like that, and our relations are great. Um, I, as I said, I can't speak to all the background as to what happened at Equinox, but it's, that, that should highlight, like, every instance uh, of of social licenses getting lost, maybe temporarily, maybe permanently, you know, the importance of not just thinking you have a community agreement, but doing everything in your power to, to maintain the integrity of that relationship long past the signing of a document. It, it goes way beyond that. So, um, yeah, well, I, I think we benefit from being, for all intents and purposes, a, a Mexican company. Uh, you know, the vast number of our, of our, our, our team are, are based down there and are Mexican. And um, there's only a few people like myself that clearly would stick out like a sore thumb when we're down there at flight. Hey, folks, uh, I, I hate to stop what is an awesome conversation, but I'm, I'm just conscious of time here. And I want to make sure that uh, I give folks the information on how they can reach you, because I'm sure there's a lot more questions where these came from. Um, so first off, I want to thank everyone who uh, who attended and who submitted questions. If you have questions that you didn't get a chance to ask here, uh, I encourage you to stay on the line. There will be a brief survey at the end, and you can submit your questions there, and we'll go straight to, to Doug. And I'm sure if you have a question for Michael, that will be passed along as well. Huge, huge thank you to Michael, and, and as always, a thank you to you, Doug. Uh, Always a pleasure, and I'd like to pass it back to, to you two for any final words. Um, I, I just want to thank Michael. Um, you know, this is a series I'm going to be doing with with both buy side uh, and and sell side analysts. Um, uh, you know, to to hopefully frame what Monera is doing in the context of the broader market, and hopefully be a more interesting. Uh, approach to presenting our story and, and valuable information for any investor just looking at the space at large. So, um, you know, Michael, thanks for being the, the first guest on this new series. And, uh, you know, hopefully it was uh, very informative. 
No, th thank you very much, Doug. Uh, always good uh, chatting with you. Always good to uh, pontificate for for a while on uh, on various uh, various subjects uh, and go back and forth. Uh, if anyone like would like to to reach me, the the handout I think is uh, available in in the chat there. Um, happy to to dig deeper on any of these uh, any of these subjects. And and thanks again, Doug and and Bianca. Take care. Okay. Thanks. thanks.